Welcome to Conversation with Friends. My name is R.O. Smith, and this is Bob Curry, who you're going to be hearing about in just a moment. But uh, Conversation with Friends is an opportunity where faith and culture can intersect and have a discussion with one another. And so this morning we've invited Bob to come. And so, uh, so Bob, tell them uh, real quick, give us a quick biography of your life. Yes, well, I, uh, I uh, grew up in Louisiana and was fortunate enough, we moved around several times. We lived in Europe for several years when I was growing up. Real quick, is there a military or why did you move? No, it was, uh, my dad worked for Exxon. Okay, for okay. Things. We served did some uh, really great trips uh, abroad and uh, spent a lot of time uh, living in Paris while I was uh, uh, in high school and that sort of thing. So um, great experience. I went to Georgia Tech and during that time I got a, a co-op job in Lancaster, California, which was to work at the NASA facility, uh, Flight Research Center, uh, fascinating place. It's where they flew the X-1, the X-15, and space shuttle first launches. So okay. I worked on the space shuttle before the first flight and pretty much all through the program in different ways. Um, toward the end, about the last 10 years of working with NASA, I got involved in the Earth Science Program and we uh, that involved flying our aircraft uh, to different places in the world where you can observe phenomena that you collect data in order to validate that the space satellite observations are accurate. Okay. And so whether you're... So if you see a weird picture on the satellite, you go and you check and say, no, that is actually happening. That, exactly. Okay. Uh, one of the best examples was the ozone hole problem the initial reaction was uh, the space, the satellites are probably bad. They're probably in Calvary. We flew our airplanes into the ozone hole, collected samples of air, and it became clearer. And, you know, it really led to, to changing uh, the rules of CFCs. And uh, so, but any number, the, the neat thing about it was, you know, I was involved in providing the aircraft support for any of these earth science topics. And so we got involved in all of the sciences in different ways, whether it was sea ice or pollution, transportation, or um, land use, climate change, hurricane formation. So, uh, you know, I dabble in all of these different really exciting fields. And so, you know, my focus was really on the aircraft. It was, uh, anyway, it was a really great opportunity. Loved every minute of it. What did, you ma- what did you major in at Georgia uh, Tech? Aerospace engineering. Okay. And then I got a earth science degree later. Uh, okay. but, um, and did you get your master's or was this all? I got a master's okay. from Johns Hopkins uh, okay. in earth science. So, um, and um, anyway, you know, I eventually retired, not because I didn't enjoy the job, just because I, you know, you want to do other things in life. And, and then other people work like long yeah, hours. Yeah, and... plenty for, you know, <laughs> a lot of good people coming along the way to do, to do stuff. And, um, and moved to San Diego, which was another great move and I just enjoyed it so much down here and um, close to family down here. This is like, close to Lancaster, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, compared it's close, but it's no. in a world of difference. I lived in LA for 14 <laughs> years, I know. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's uh, boy, it's drastically different yeah. in terms of climate, but it's, uh, but I loved Lancaster going, I mean, it was a, if you like airplanes, that's, yeah, that's the place, place to, go. to go. So, Mm-hmm. So, you know, moving around, how many languages do you speak? Can I ask? Oh, you? just, uh, I speak English, but can <laughs> not barely well. get by, you know, can understand some French and Spanish, Okay, but, uh, no, I'm not very... So, moving around, and uh, tell me a little bit about your faith background, like how, um, how did you come to, come to know Christ? Yeah, and... yeah. Sure, um, I, you know, I grew up, again, uh, from earliest days, I went to church by, by folks, and it was a Methodist church, uh, it was, you know... I suppose it was very progressive. I mean, it was very uh, open to self-inquiry, uh, learning for yourself, and I just always assumed that was the role of a Christian. Is you know, you were always studying your faith, and you're always uh, testing what you believe and think. And, and so, I kind of just had that ingrained in me. I've never had any trouble moving, going to a different church. You know, attended Baptist church, Presbyterian church has been terrific for us. Uh, Really, I've never found a church where you know, you, you know, once you have that mindset that you know, really, you're kind of responsible for your own beliefs. Mm-hmm. You know, that that plays well almost anywhere. And, uh, you, and so, I guess beyond that, I've never had any great revelation. Uh, but it, anyway, that, yeah, that's what I'd say about it. So it's just kind of been a steady. It, it, there's no like yeah. 
yeah, slain in the no, spirit kind of. You're just like, oh, that's kind of a, that's awesome. Yeah. That's, no, that's great. <laughs> I think I think a lot of people look for where's this big moment, and you're like, I just kind of lived yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So you are involved with a couple organizations I want to just hear about, but Engineers Without Borders. It sounds, uh, from yeah. what I can gather, it's a kind of a volunteer group that helps create infrastructures for places around the world that struggle that maybe can't. Um, that's like with basic. Yeah, that's right. Basic. It sounds, you know, of course, it sounds like. Uh, Doctors Without Borders patterned in the same way. Okay. It's a lot and not near as exciting. We do not go to, you know, there's no need for the kind of work we do to go to war zones or places where disease are breaking out. Doctors Without Borders, those are really brave mm-hmm. people, I think, mm-hmm. and there's yeah, a lot of respect for them. But our, our, our con- contribution is more in terms of, yeah, projects that we can do to build infrastructure in developing communities. We try to work with a community, self-contained, so they can speak for themselves, they can take over the work mm-hmm. after we're done. And so, yeah, it's mostly things like... They become to, self-reliant and yeah. self-empowered. That's yeah. awesome. Um, how, did, how and why did you get involved with Engineers Without Borders? I mean, obviously, you have to... Part of mindset me, and the education, yeah. but what made you want to um, do that? A couple of things. I guess certainly, you know, it's, uh, you know, just humanitarian issue. I mean, you just can't help but ignore... You can't really ignore... You know the hard, uh, the challenges that some people in the world are dealing with every day. Um, I enjoy engineering, and like I say, enjoy traveling all my life, and have gotten to go some unusual places. And so this is engineers without borders uh, really kind of filled both of those uh, needs for me. Not that it is about myself, but it's very satisfying, and that you're working hands on with. The people who are going to uh, benefit, the people you're working with, you're uh, uh, living with them for a period of time in these uh, villages. You know, you see what it's like to carry water three hours a day or two yeah. hours a day. And, um, yeah, you're not getting so, a hotel somewhere and coming in. Exactly. You're like, it's, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's and, great. Um, what uh, what was the weird? What's the most interesting place that you have ever that you're visited? God, that's a hard thing to say. Uh, you know. Um, some of it, with, you know, I worked with engineers, I worked with some other volunteer research organizations that, you know, went to Mongolia to count wildlife and went to Borneo to, to, to work with rainforest redevelopment, uh, just quite, they're just all so different. Uh, Cameron, living in the, this really jungle town where they are, again, they had a water supply problem and, you know, you really learn about you know, it's a beautiful place. They have, they grow all their food. They have uh, basic needs. They have no way to raise any cash. There's nothing they can sell that will make any money. And you know, they they struggle to have fresh water, uh, safe water. And you know, we tested the water. You know, half of the taps were contaminated, or mm-hmm. there's you know, and it's you find out that you know, uh, you know, how many these surveys, you know, how many people have been been sick, uh, you know, how often are you saying? It's like every, every week one of our kids can't go to school, right. you know, because of uh, you know, dehydration, yeah. dehydration, you know, and um, so uh, lots of things that, you know, compared to our life, so our resources, you know, it's, it's really quite feasible to really change the quality of life in some of these areas with 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 techniques and processes that we almost take for granted. And so. Um, was there one place, or is there, I don't know, I'm just trying to think, is there one place that was, you maybe had like, I would say, a described as a spiritual experience, where you helped this village, and, or and you being part of their story for a little bit, and you just kind of had this moment where you knew this is, this is, you were created to do this, and God like <laughs> met you, you know, or you maybe you had a connection with the village, I don't know if you had any of that, that kind of experience where, I'm not, it was just sure about that so much, it's, um, I guess you know engineers are that borders. It's it's distinctly I know it's, yeah, I know distinctly it's not secular, yeah. and uh, and it works hard to be that way because it doesn't want to totally I mean, yeah it doesn't want to and, and at the same time you're you're seeing other faith based organizations do really good work. Uh, there's no distinct there's no dis- distinction between them. But um, I don't know if you like created a a water tap for a village and it yeah. was just so crucial and they just. That was just so moving that you, or, or maybe yeah. it was so hard to build or something. I was no, for of, most of mine have been kind of on the front end, like setting up the agreements and and you know, that part of it is 
TLSI finally signed an agreement with the group, and you're, this is a lot of trust building. Mm. You know, they're not really sure where you're and A lot of them do assume that you've got some agenda uh, that you're bringing, you know, we're going to fix your water system, but we're expecting, you know, you're all going to become uh, Muslim, but, you know, <laughs> right, and, um, right, right. You know, it takes a long time to, to build that trust. You have to build trust with the surrounding community so that they don't react badly to, you know, you're improving their system, but what about us? And yeah. So really signing the agreements are, are a big deal, you know, just kicking, kicking them off, getting everybody on board together. Mm-hmm. Now you're also very involved with climate change. A CCL, what is it? What's the CCL? Yeah, I, I volunteer with Citizens Climate Law. Oh, yeah, there it is. It's a grassroots organization, uh, all volunteer, big organization, a hundred thousand people or so, all over okay. the country, and uh, it is promoting, uh, trying to build the political will to enact a good climate policy for the country. And, uh, you know, it's clearly dealing with climate change, uh, but it's distinctly a uh, nonpartisan effort. We are not, uh, we, aren't, we aren't seeing it as a Democrat or Republican issue. We see it as a, a global issue. Right. And honestly, uh, we talk to every district in the country and, and nobody's against dealing with climate change. Mm-hmm. Nobody, you know, everybody knows it's a, almost everybody knows it's a serious issue. The challenge is how to get good policy developed that both parties can support, pass a bill that will endure, for, you know, and uh, and mm-hmm. really make a change. So a um, bill where both parties can get over themselves and just kind of. That's, <laughs> and and again, climate know, change may be one of the best opportunities because there because you know. You know, every you know, this is yeah. It's bigger than it's bigger than either either party. It's, yeah. Uh, so what uh, was there a moment in your life? I mean, obviously your your work with NASA helped with that, but was yeah. there something that awakened you to be like, I want to be an advocate for climate change? Yeah. Um, and a, yeah. a lot of things from looking at the world globally, these NASA missions. A lot of them were collecting data sets that I mean, the satellite data is are what build the long term global averages of, of how the science is playing out, and the science becomes undeniable. I mean, there's, you know, you can't look at the data any other way. But, uh, you know, we would go in and deal with, uh, you know, fielded our missions into places like the Maldives, and uh, we operated an airplane uh, project out of there because they've got big towering cumulus clouds over the equator that play a big role if you model them differently in terms of climate. So, you know, we based the mission out of there, and they're just, the Maldives have some spectacular resort islands uh, that are, you know, the, the best of the best, $2,000 a day uh, facilities, and we weren't on any of them. We were on like one of the, tip, one of the um, Muslim native islands. You know, you can't get to these places unless you're invited in as a worker research. So it was, it was a great thing. We're on an island about a mile long and half a mile wide, and you meet these people. You work with them every day, and um, you know they're just they're just like us. You know, you barely speak enough to get by, but um, you know they're coming to work every day. They're trying to get their kids to school, to go to school, and get uh, learn learn what they need. And they're you know uh, you know worried about the same things we were about. And you work with them for you know several weeks, and then you realize you know they're probably, these are low lying islands. Mm-hmm. They are going away. Mm-hmm. You know sea level is mm-hmm. going to overwhelm them. And um, mm-hmm. I you know definitely you're supporting these science projects through NASA. It's intellectually stimulating, fascinating how the science works together, and you know. Um, but this is when you know it really strikes home. You see, this this is the real impact of what's happening here. These people are, you know, they're losing their. Mm. I mean, there are kids on these islands who, if they've gone anywhere, maybe they've gone to another nearby island that might be two miles big, you know. Right. And, and that's the big city for them. Yeah, yeah. everything they've seen may be underwater. Right. In their lifetime, and so anyway, I mean, that kind of you know, when you really uh, see something like that, you. Um, uh, you can't really ignore the uh, 
the significance of that science. It's interesting, but it's also threatening the future. It's threatening us right now. Yeah, it's kind of when you see the when you get out of the policies, when you get out of the books, and you see how it's actually impacting day to day lives. It, Exactly. Exactly. So, which exactly. kind of makes you know. So, you've had the opportunity to tr do a lot of travel with Engineer Without Borders and also the CCL group, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, you see things kind of on global scales or on political scales, kind of big macro levels. And so, how has the your work on the macro level? How does it affect your day to day? Because you know, people are probably thinking, oh, I don't know if I'll ever get involved with a lobbyist group or a, oh, or, yeah, a, yeah. or on, or I'll be able to travel to Uganda or wherever, but how, right. but yeah. what can, what do you do on your day to day that maybe our audience could say, I can do that on my day to day? Yeah, well, I'm um, certainly in these, uh, the subject of climate change, um, you know, the real response that, that needs to happen is not so much individual actions in terms of, you know, trying to, you know, certainly it makes sense to try to use less gas or to or to reduce your carbon footprint, no doubt about it, just like it, it doesn't make sense to litter or, or do right. anything to damage the environment. But the real change has to come as a policy. We have to, as a country, decide we want to take this on. And uh, so the real work that has to be done is, like I say, really just building the political sport so that uh, Congress can pass a good uh, policy. Hmm. We have a, uh, a, an approach that we favor. It's been through lots of economic analyses. Both parties have supported it. It's a bipartisan effort. We have a bipartisan bill in-house right now, and we're just trying to gain support. Uh, mostly, there are districts where congressmen are uncomfortable with whether their constituents will support it. Hmm. And so, you know, most, what do you do with that? Well, most of it is uh, letter writing, talking to other people, talking to organizations and such when you get a chance to let people know about this, to, you know, just alert their congressmen that, you know, I'm, I stand behind a, a good, a good climate change bill. We also engage in lobbying our Congress every, every year or two, uh, we'll make a trip back to Washington, meet with your local, back, meet with we meet in teams with uh, congressmen from every district, like I say, and uh, it's again it's very fascinating. But it, you know, it's a whole different kind of volunteer work than wading through swamps in Borneo. But it's very, uh, but it's just as important, I think. And and boy, anybody can get involved in that so easily. I and I would encourage any you know climate change. Many people are upset about, worried about it. You see things happening, the, it seems so clear, you know, the damage is happening to the, you know, it's happening to the poorest people in the world, the people who did nothing to cause it. They're mm. the ones who are going to really pay the price. Mm. And, you know, and if it upsets you, you know, don't get mad and yell on TV, you know, this, you can get involved in a group like this. It's very positive. We only lobby with, I mean, we always make a point of treating every mm -hmm. politician with respect and think we, we uh, never attack their position or criticize their votes. It's very upbeat, up, you know, just being a part of the organization is a really positive experience. Mm -hmm. What do you think is a, like, a theology of climate? When you think of, it, like, what is God, you know, because I think some people, there's obviously one extreme that's drive big yeah. cars, just who cares, we're, you know, do have a new earth one day and just we can destroy this one. And then there's people who are, you know, on the other side and it's just like, everything's about climate and you step on an yeah. ant, you're like destroy, And it's like, okay, there's gotta be something in between there, right? But wait, you know, have you, have you, have you thought about theology of climate? Certainly, and in fact, our group, you know, CCL has numerous splinter groups, everything from medical industry to the oil industry, and there are several church-based uh, splinter groups. One of them is Presbyterian, which is a very active working group. They brought several uh, items to General Assembly, supporting, you know, trying to gain attention for our policy approaches. Um, and there are many, event there are many uh, theologians in our group, and there's both approaches. There's just the approach of stewardship of the earth. You know, how can we say we're managing the we're taking stewardship of the earth if we know that our lifestyle is degrading the, the environment. We know what's going to happen if we continue to put energy into the troposphere. 
Uh, and then the other side of it is just the fairness issue. Like I say, um, everybody will be affected by climate change. We'll be okay. You know, we're pretty rich. We'll we'll suffer, but not that bad. But the poorest people in the world. Everything that affects them gets exponentially worse with climate change. Mm. Famines, floods, uh, political instability, droughts, storms. It's all worse with climate change. And, and they're the people who are they're suffering now, and it's, we're doing that to them. I mean, mm. we, could, we, could, we could do better, mm. and, uh, and now we know it. So, yeah. So, yeah it's, uh, I, I read a book, uh, an author, he talked about... Um, you know, asking the question, where does your trash go? When yeah, he said, yeah, yeah. And he said, if, if that doesn't shake you to your core and, 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 and you know, and help you understand that this is a spiritual issue, then you, I can't help you. You know, it was like really interesting. I was like, oh, that's pretty interesting. You know, because we, we just kind of throw away our trash and we don't think about where does it go? Where does it process? Yeah. He said, you know, that's a spiritual, our trash is a spiritual issue. And I was like, I was like oh, that's yeah, 150 fascinating. 50 years ago, we, we had, Slavery was an institution, and there were people who were defending it right. to the very end, even when everybody knew it was bad. Yeah, it just does not right. fit with the with the Constitution of America. It doesn't right. fit with any of our principles, and yet we continue to support it for for decades after that became aware. Mm. We look back now, and that just it's just hard to believe. Yeah. I mean, look at people who wrote passionate speeches about the importance mm -hmm. of it. You know, that's going to be us in 50 years. Everybody's going to know what happened. They, they know we knew. We, they know we knew the science. Yeah. When you wonder, in 150 years, people are going to look at this generation and go, what were they thinking? <laughs> you know? yeah. But it's, you don't know until you're in it. But, yeah. Um, so you work, with, obviously, you worked with NASA, and there's kind of the cultural narrative that says faith and science are these dichotomies, and they don't go together. Uh, how has your work with NASA and, both helped your faith blossom and grow, and then how has it challenged your faith? And um, yeah, um, it really, you know, uh, again, I think maybe from my background, my earliest uh, Sunday school experience uh, growing up, uh, I just was always kind of felt that churches promoted a, a spirit of inquiry and testing ideas and thinking, you know, uh, questioning, and just having that in my background. I mean. It, it, Never considered a conflict between science and and uh, faith. Um, um, I honestly learned about it more from the news. You start reading reports hmm. of people who see this as a, you know, can't can't reconcile uh, evolution and the Bible, or can't reconcile. Uh, they, they think they feel feel like it's one or the other, and um, you know, it, it took a long time to really uh, kind of understand where they were where they were coming from, hmm. and. Um, you know, there's there's fascinating examples of all this. You know, I knew people at I knew people at NASA who, you know, believed in you know the Earth is six thousand years old. They were working on a telescope that was only saw light from thirty thousand light years away, and you know could never you know not not really sure how they they resolved that. But um, <laughs> but we uh, you see that you know it, it's been interesting. Mm. I have found. You know, being immersed in you know scientific and a technical world, indeed, you know, uh, you know, engineers think critically. They test every idea. They do naturally question sources of data, and um, and um, it's very important in maybe in a uh, research environment. But in truth, I really see that as the way human culture is moving quickly. Mm. And I'm not sure everybody is appreciating this so much, but really our generations, we do as a whole think critically. We don't take information at face value anymore. And um, that's a good thing. This is a natural evolution, you know. For a long time, people couldn't read, then they learned to read. That was great, they could get information from books. Now we're at the point where that's not good enough. Books are everywhere, the internet's everywhere, information is everywhere. We've got to be able to sort out what is what you want to believe or not. Mm. And um, so I really think we're in a, a new era of critical thinking becoming the norm. That 
is I think going to have some big effects on how religion mm. forms in the future because that's going to be a challenge for many people who have faith today. For 500 years, you've been able to say, well, you know, you go read the book for yourself. You can, you know, you're literate. We've we translated the Bible from Latin into English. Everybody can study it, learn for yourself. But there's always been that sense that, but, but we take the Bible as an authority. We've right. got an authoritative text here. Right. That's going to change in years to come. We've got to, I think, start to learn how to translate the gospel into a language that critical thinkers will accept. Mm -hmm. And and what we turn, you know, if we if we go to somebody who's not predisposed toward faith or Christianity, and you start out with the saying, well, you got to believe all this. We're not. We don't understand some mystery. A lot of it's mysterious to us too. Right. But you gotta, you gotta just put your faith in it, and it'll all work yeah, out. Yeah, just trust it. Right. It makes no sense. It, you know, five hundred years ago there was only one book to offer them. Now there's dozens mm -hmm. of religions mm -hmm. that say that. You know, mm -hmm. how do we? Uh... So I think that's going to be a big challenge of the day, mm -hmm. and um, it's an exciting time. But I, I, I hope we, uh, hope we succeed. Yeah, I mean, I th yeah, it's uh, every. I feel like every culture has. You know, they go through, it goes through cycles, and right now we're in the you know with the postmodern you know mm -hmm. movement that have, has kind of deconstructed so much. You're like, what's going to be the post postmodern movement? And okay. what, you yeah. know, we, yeah. and when you when you talk about critical thinkers, I, I, I always and all the information that we have, I, I wonder if we'll have people that we have critical thinkers, but do we have people that have time to actually think critically and rightly about things and to Put it in perspective, rather than oh, I just I'm just going to question everything and move on. But they never, yes, yes, you know, build or create the middle. So it'll be interesting. It's an yes. interesting time. So. It is. It is. I think I'm more optimistic than a lot of people. I think um, I do think as a transition, we've suddenly become flooded with information, and we're going to have to respond one way or other. We can't just believe everything. Or right? you've got to become smart about what you believe. I think young people are growing up knowing this. Mm -hmm. The most vulnerable people are older people, you know, who have kind of new to information, new to laptops, new to social media. They've still got that mindset. Well, if you read it on, I found something on the internet that supports my thought, you know, so I've done my research, you know. Young people don't think that way. They know, they know it's just another source of information. So I think we are going to move past it. It may, may take a while, but. Well, Bob, thank you so much for joining us. This has been so good. This has been so fun. Um, just uh, giving us a lot, a lot to think about, hopefully critically, right? Uh, again, thank you for joining us for Conversations with Friends. We hope to see you. If you would, uh, if you like what you saw here, uh, share this episode with somebody and and uh, and go to our YouTube page. And while you're there, go ahead and like and subscribe and ring the bell, as I like to say, so you can get future notifications. Um, but uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye.